What if I told you that a single tabletop game laid the foundation for one of the largest and most profitable genres of media to ever exist, and is inadvertently responsible for the creation of some of your favorite fantasy worlds? Let me explain. Think about your favorite fantasy game, movie, or series. The action-packed fight scenes, the incredible creatures and interesting characters, all with their own unique abilities and compelling stories. Some seem to have spawned from some director or developer's sickly twisted mind, and others appear to be pure art in their world-building, delivery, and overall depth. Sometimes it makes you take a step back and wonder, how the hell did they come up with this stuff? Well, it has been theorized that all of these worlds we've come to cherish spawned out of the endless scenarios and stories of one of America's most notable and controversial tabletop games. I'm of course talking about Dungeons and Dragons, aka D&D. But first, we have to go back to where it all started. Dungeons & Dragons, more commonly referred to as D&D, is a fantasy tabletop role-playing game first published in 1974 by a studio called Tactical Studies Rules Incorporated, or TSR for short. While the game itself was vastly original, the rule system was derived from earlier board games, commonly referred to at the time as the miniature war games genre of games. With no internet or advanced video games, these miniature war games were the closest a 1970s kid could get to a AAA title video game, or an immersive movie like Lord of the Rings. The rule system of D&D in particular was derived from the 1971 game Chainmail, which was a game in the miniature war games genre focusing on simulating medieval combat and strategy. Chainmail is typically credited as the first ever modern role-playing game, and appears to be the game that started the industry. After the initial release of D&D, it had incredible success, selling 150 copies in its first month. While that may not seem like a lot, we are talking about a no-name publisher in 1974 here. The game's creators, Gary Gygax and Dave Arnonson, couldn't find a publisher to produce D&D until they formed a TSR together out of Gygax's dining room. Under TSR, Gygax and Arnonson only created a handful of sets and advertised it minimally, with no TV ads, just some prints and word of mouth. However, as the game began flying off the shelves, TSR quickly created a thousand more sets and began selling more and more. Unfortunately for TSR, the popularity and low supply of the game was actually detrimental to its success for a time. Pirated remakes began popping up for lower prices, attempting to gain off of the game's success. D&D retailed for around $10, which at the time was a ridiculous amount of money to spend on a board game. However, over time, TSR was able to corral many of these pirates and protect their intellectual property. Just 10 years after the game's launch, D&D had propelled Gygax from a lonely game creator, making board games out of his dining room, to a multi-millionaire living in Beverly Hills with a massive gaming empire spanning the United States and United Kingdom. Now you might think that was it. D&D soared to success quickly and had a steady player base ever since, all the way up until today. But you'd be quite wrong, because D&D actually had a long, turbulent, and often controversial history. After gaining his wealth, it wasn't long before corporate deceit and greed befell TSR, and Gary Gygax was forced out of the company entirely by 1985. This did not stop Gygax, however, as he attempted to reclaim his throne as king of the role-playing games by creating a competitor to his once-beloved D&D. However, TSR continued to drag him through lengthy litigation to thwart these attempts, and without Gygax at the helm, TSR felt the pressure of competing games such as Vampire the Masquerade, which came out in 1991. In order to innovate and stay relevant, TSR began experimenting with CD-ROMs, or video versions of games on CDs. 
While innovative at the time, they were incredibly expensive to produce in the early 1990s. So to pay for this, TSR hired a distributor by the name of Random House, who paid TSR for the product when it arrived at their warehouse, not when they were actually sold to bookstores. This led to an overproduction of the CDs, with hundreds of thousands of them sitting to waste in warehouses. Without a steady flow of income, Random House stopped purchasing from TSR, and TSR became indebted to their CD printer, as they had no way to sell hundreds of thousands of CDs that they had now overproduced. By 1996, Random House had returned millions of dollars of product to TSR, and TSR began laying off employees. On top of the problems that were happening within TSR, the game was getting an incredible amount of public backlash by a woman by the name of Patricia Pulling, whose son, Irving Pulling, committed suicide in 1983, following a long history of playing the game. The game of Dungeons and Dragons has been around since the early 70s, is played by an estimated 5 million people. It is also the target of a group of concerned parents in the United States who call themselves BAD, B-A-D-D, bothered about Dungeons and Dragons. The reason they are bothered is because they believe the game has been involved in a number of murders and suicides across the United States and now in Canada. At the trial of a 14-year-old boy who admitted to strangling a young Orangeville, Ontario girl and her brother, it was revealed the accused had been playing the game for 18 months, had in fact been a dungeon master of his own group for five months. Patricia sued the creators of D&D, citing that the game encouraged devil worship and demon summoning. She would also found Bothered by Dungeons and Dragons, or BAD for short, which was an activist organization focused on anti-cult protests. However, all of Patricia Pulling's attempt at litigation failed, and her pursuit for justice would end with a book she wrote entitled The Devil's Web, Who is Stalking Your Children for Satan, which was published in 1989. Patricia was not the only activist throwing her hat in the ring against D&D, however, a journalist and minister by the name of William Bill Schnobelin published two long essays against the game, each one about a decade apart. The essays were entitled Straight Talk on Dungeons and Dragons and Should a Christian Play Dungeons and Dragons? The first article described D&D as a feeding program for occultism and witchcraft, which violates the commandment of Thessalonians 5.22, abstain from all appearance of evil. The second essay was much tamer and was merely a comparative piece describing how the fantasy world betrayed in Dungeons and Dragons is a direct contrast to Christian belief. And thus, Schnobelin questioned the morality of parents that allowed their children to partake in what was a direct deviation from the path of God. This led TSR to removing many demon and hell references from the second version of the game. The controversy did not stop there, however. As D&D grew in popularity, a young boy by the name of James Dallas Egbert III committed suicide in the utility tunnels under the campus of Michigan State University. Egbert's parents had hired a private investigator by the name of William Deere to search for the boy, which became a widely publicized search. During an interview, William Deere commented that he suspected the boy had gotten lost during a live-action version of D&D which, despite being false, became a running news story widely publicized as fact. This was only exacerbated by Rona Jaff's book entitled Mazes and Monsters, which was released in 1981 and was a fictional depiction of the Egbert case. This controversy caught up to TSR, along with its poor handling of the company itself, and it seemed like everything was about to crumble. All seemed lost and the fate of Dungeons & Dragons seemed to be sealed. Until something remarkable happened. A large gaming company by the name of Wizards of the Coast rose to fame for the creation of the widely popular game Magic the Gathering in 1993. By the death of TSR in the mid to late 1990s, Wizards of the Coast was filled to the brim with expendable income due to the success of Magic. Seeing the success of D&D about to die at the hands of a failing TSR, CEO of Wizards of the Coast Peter Atkinson bought TSR and brought it into the Wizards of the Coast umbrella. Under Wizards of the Coast, many TSR employees were offered new jobs and the headquarters for the company was built in Seattle. 
Three months after the acquisition, D&D was being produced at the largest scale it had ever been, fitted with a new look. Atkinson, now seeing the success of D&D revived, wanted to rebuild a bridge that had long been burned. Gary Gygax, the co-creator of D&D, had been separated from his property for nearly a decade at this time. Atkinson made the decision to begin writing intellectual property checks to Gary and his family, giving them a financial stake in the success of the game. While this could have very well just been out of the goodness of Atkinson's heart, Atkinson would go on to state that many gamers at the time thought D&D's original creators had been cheated and felt poorly about purchasing the game. Eventually, Gary Gygax would pass away in 2008, and his son, Luke Gygax, would found GaryCon, an annual celebration of role-playing games devoted to his late father. By this point, Wizards of the Coast had solidified their commitment to gamers and game creators as a responsible owner of a now-beloved game, and this would only pay dividends when Wizards of the Coast would be acquired by Hasbro in 1999. Today, there are still an estimated 13 million active D&D players worldwide, a dedicated fan base equipped with thousands of online resources, blogs, chat rooms, and more. An already bustling community still growing due to the influence of the game forming many notable pieces in modern media. Most notably, the creation of the popular Netflix original Stranger Things, which features the game heavily. But why does all of that matter? What significance does this popular board game have on anything other than its players? The answer is the foundation of modern fantasy. It would be impossible to list all of the monsters, characters, races, species, weapons, and powers of D&D without making a five hour long video. And for that reason, you will find D&D inspiration in nearly every single one of fantasy's most popular movies, TV, and video games. The Dwarves and Dragons of The Hobbit, The Wizards of Harry Potter, The Elemental Kingdoms of Adventure Time, The Weapons of Guardians of the Galaxy, The Powers of Marvel, DZ, and Avatar The Last Airbender. I could go on and on. All of it found its home in D&D first. And while many could argue that many of these concepts existed before D&D, I would argue that while that may be true, it is only because of the folklore and stories that have existed for generations, and it was D&D who actually brought those stories to life. There are countless instances of ancient fairy tales being brought to life in the book of D&D, only for that same creature to appear in popular media years later. And while it is positive that D&D is being revived and brought back into the mainstream in a more accepting light than it was in the 1980s or 1990s, it still appears as though modern enjoyers of the miniature war games genre are still quite ridiculed, despite their ever-increasing popularity and mountain of D&D-inspired pieces such as Pathfinder and Betrayal at Baldur's Gate. So with that in mind, I thought it was only right to test the validity of this theory and interview both D&D enjoyers and those who haven't yet entered the world of proud nerds and fantasy enthusiasts. There you go. Hand over to me. That's why I said hold it, Brad. Cool, 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 cool. It's 4K HD. Anyway, so hello, Christian. Uh, first question, what is your current character and what is their story? So my current character in our campaign, which is a Star Wars campaign, is a reprogrammed assassin droid named IG-666, or as everybody refers to him as Sixes, and he's just... Not this, satanic at all? No. Not, 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 he's, even, not, even, not even a little bit? Not a little bit. Okay. He just doesn't give a shit about anything, he's just there to do his mission and leave. That's, and what is his mission? It all depends on what our current objective is. Most of the time it's just kill. Kill? Mainly kill. kill. Yes. Great. So what is a dungeon master, and do you prefer it to playing as a character? So what a dungeon master essentially is, is the guy who runs the game. He comes up with the story, or he uses the story from the supplementary books uh, that Wizards of the Coast publishes, and he runs the entire campaign. He's the main guy who does everything with uh, association with his players. Um, 
I've been a Deem for a little while now, longer than I've been a player, and I do miss playing the game. So I'm about 50-50 on... Well, You're 50 50 being, being a player yeah. or a dungeon master. What, yeah, are, what are the perks of being a dungeon master? Um, you actually get to craft the world, you get to make it your own and have a really good story. While the players have some aspect of that because the whole thing is a collaborative storytelling game. Um, as the DM, I feel like you just you have more control and you can make it your own and <clears throat> change things that need to be changed according to. What's happening in the situation? <laughs> Are you proud to be a D&D player? Yeah, I mean, I have a lot of fun doing it. It's just something that gets me out of the house, gets me hanging out with friends and just like-minded people. It's just fun time. We goof off a lot and make a bunch of jokes. There's a bunch of inside jokes now from it. So it's just one of those things that you can do. Yes, absolutely. You're absolutely proud. Why? Yeah. Uh, I... I enjoy it. It's one of my hobbies. I don't care if people make fun of me. I get made fun of it for it, for it a lot. I re- I really don't care. What well, what are what are the things that most people say when they make fun of you? Uh, they call me a nerd and dork. They don't understand it. They've never done it. It's... They don't know, man. <laughs> they don't, <laughs> they don't, they don't know what it's they like to be in the trenches, like. man. No, it's funny though because I'll I'll those same people who make fun of me. I'll talk about playing like they've played RPGs like video game RPGs like. Okay, well, it's just the same thing, except now you're crafting the story. So, so what got you into D and D? What was what was the start? So it was originally back in high school. I had a buddy who was in band with me, whose dad ran a campaign, and he had invited me out to try it. And so I was like, sure, I'll do it. And then I invited Brad, so we both started there, and then kind of started to branch out and we started our own can or brad started his own campaign i was one of the first players and then we've just been doing it ever since so i'd say about four years now uh so my love for D D originally started with just regular old tabletop games dice games card games um back in high school i started watching will wheaton's tabletop and he did a lot of tabletop games and i knew all from that, I wanted to branch off and do other things like RPGs, and I wanted to play D&D. I just thought at the beginning that it was going to be too expensive for me to get in it. Lo and behold, everything's online, so it's not really as expensive as it seems. Um, I got invited out by by my buddy Christian, who you're also interviewing today, um, to join a group, and we all started that together. I know that you're, you're a creator yourself, you're a creator of music. Is as a creator, do you think that D and D makes you more creative at all? Uh, kind of. For me, it doesn't translate as much, but I would say it definitely has a creative element that I add to both D and D and music. Do you have any D and D tattoos? I do not. You do not. No. I'm crazy. What Absolutely. You, you got to be creative to play this game. Um. At least, in my opinion, you, you do. Uh, there's been plenty of players and that I've I've dealt with who are don't put as much effort into the creative side of things as they do into the numbers and the tactic sides of things, which is fine to each their own. How you want to play the game, it's your decision. But I think you have to have some level of creativity to be able to hop in this. What's your favorite edition of D and D, and why? Okay, so I've only played 5e, so that is the only edition I can vouch for, which is why it's my favorite edition. Um, I've looked back at the other editions, um, particularly 3 uh, three and 4, with 4 being um, very much criticized for changing way too much things, which is why a lot of people stuck and played 3 until 5e came out. I, uh, there's a lot of good things about it. I think 5e has done a lot more balancing as far as i've read and with um the newest edition that wizards of coast is working on D D one i think they're backtracking on balancing issues same as brad i've only played 5e so that's the only one that i know so it's kind of one that i've versed myself well in to try and memorize learn and just kind of play more than anything i haven't even really looked at the other editions i've heard stories but that's about it have you ever wanted to try the other ones there's been some interest to try but nothing 
like I'm gonna go out of my way. Like if he does it, cool. If we don't, it's whatever. So, do you know what the Satanic Panic was, and what are your thoughts on it? Satanic Panic was a thing back in the '80s where it not only targeted D and D, but it also targeted music as well, especially the music that I listen to, which is heavy metal and rock and roll. A lot of Christians who were he- like more prominent around that time because it was the Reagan era. Uh, flipped out. That, Screw Reagan, right? Yeah. yeah everyone knows. knows. Everyone knows Reagan was the downfall of D and D. Yeah. You, you. No. Absolutely not. Uh, but no. During that Reagan era, there was a lot of Christians who got really mad and pissed off about uh, and flipped out about all this this supposed Satanism that this that D and D was supposedly witchcraft and all this heavy music was corrupting the youth and all of that. Uh, I thought it was really dumb, and it led to quite a few people's lives actually getting ruined. Everything was corrupting the youth or making America crazy, and it was just this time frame in American history where it was just bad shit. To put in the easiest terms, everything was just terrible for you. It's terrible for the kids, and turns out none of that was true. Do you think D&D is being handled well now in the hands of Hasbro? And why do you think that way? D&D has been owned by Hasbro for a while now. Um, As far as it being handled for a while, I think it was handled really, really well. Um, In recent years with, actually just in recent months with the OGL being targeted. Um, And if you don't know what that is, that was the open gaming license. Um, Back in, I believe it was 2000, Wizards of the Coast published the open gaming license, which allowed for third-party creators to publish their own content using uh, basics from D&D and uh, make their own content that they could profit off of without having to pay royalties to Wizards of the Coast. I think because Hasbro is a greedy corporation and it started to rub off in Wizards of the Coast, they started to try to change that to make those creators pay royalties and sign over their rights away to their content that they that they created. Um, what well, kind of like a game punishing their modding community? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly, yeah, that's a great way to put it. That's exactly what it is. Um, luckily, the community fought back and Wizards of the Coast lost a lot of money because a lot of people canceled their subscriptions for stuff like uh, D&D Beyond and uh, the community won. So they... Uh, for the people. Yeah. For the people. The community won. They uh, and Wizards of the Coast decided not to publish the OGL 1.1. Uh, I feel like it was, and then once they got comfortable with it, they did the classic Hasbro "Give me money," and now it's just kind of a tough subject that we're getting through. But the community is definitely starting to win out, and I'm proud of that. So uh, what was their initial, like, what were the initial things that told you, like, oh, they're getting greedy with it? As soon as they started to kind of raise prices on, like, the edition books, the player's handbook, even online, it was still through, like, D&D Beyond. It was, I think, when we started in 2019, it was, like, 20 bucks, I want to say. And then come these past couple of years, it's gone up to, like, 30 almost 40 bucks so it's almost doubled in price for the same content would you compare it somewhat to like a like an electronic arts like adding expansions to it but like charging a paywall each and every time kind of except it's like taking a game that they've had and released and just raising the price over the years Mm. instead of like keeping it the same adding to it it's Okay, we're going to raise the base price as well as all these extra DLC that are saying the same price. What would you say to someone who's on the fence about trying the game? Do it. Like, if you don't like it, you can just quit. Like, it's not not that big of a deal. Um, I, I don't knock it until you try it. If it sounds like something you'd be interested in, if you play video game RPGs, JRPGs, anything like that in a video game form, um then you'll probably love this. If you're a creative type, you'll probably love this with the ability to all the creation you can do. Um, I, you, it is a bit of a, it's not as open, openly as like, um, 
free range as some people may think. Like, I came into it thinking that, oh, it's all creation. No, I was not aware that there was a set of rules and guidelines to follow before joining, but now I think it actually helps. But if you're, yeah, if you're a creative type, if you like RPGs, do it. Best question, why are you a nerd? Why am I a nerd? Why are you a nerd? I've been a nerd all my life. Why am I a nerd? I don't know. I guess you could say because I like the the standard nerdy things. I like Star Wars. I like Star Wars before it was mainstream. Before Disney. Oh, that was the it. nerdiest thing you could have ever said. You listen to that, nerds? He was nerdy before you were nerdy. All right, continue. Yeah, no. So I, I like D&D. I like um, Star Wars. I like Pokemon. I'm a huge Marvel nerd. I'm, I'm just, you know, I deep dive into things and try to absorb as much knowledge as possible about it. I'm a music nerd, I'm a gaming nerd, so. <laughs> Last question. Why are you a nerd? I'm friends with Brad. I blame him. So Brad is what caused you to become a nerd? Absolutely. Yeah? Screw that guy. So you, you were you were super cool before you met Brad? Oh, absolutely. Okay. You know. So so, <laughs> so, so why why did you sacrifice your coolness for Brad? No, nah, I just find all that... St- stuff interesting like growing up i followed star wars uh marvel dc spider-man because that's separate because sony uh spider-man slaps though spider-man's so good transformers you know just anything it if it caught my attention i just megan fox caught your attention definitely yeah okay 100 percent. that's what me too Rewatchability. <laughs> it's a lot of rewatchability in Transformers. If you didn't know. Everybody should know at this point. But what would you say to someone who's afraid to be to be judged or be afraid to be viewed as a nerd if they were to play the game? Don't care. Don't care. Simple as that. <laughs> oh well, somebody calls you something. Drink about it. <laughs> Drink about it. Just look at them. There there's something for everybody that they nerd out about, whether it be sports, video games, D and D, books, art, everybody has their own nerd out moment or subject. So in a way, you can't really call anybody a nerd because everybody's a nerd. Exactly. People just like to hide it. It's now been nine weeks since I first deep dived into the world of D&D. At first, I didn't know why I was making what I was making. Was I shitting on the game and its players? Did I want to know more about the culture, or was I simply bored? I guess the cool thing is, I found out along the way. Regardless of your opinions of D&D, you can't deny the impact it has had on modern culture, particularly in our modern fantasy media. But if you throw all of that out the window, what you are left with is that maybe it wasn't D&D that created all of those characters and worlds. Maybe it was simply those who were too creative to let their pride get in the way of making something cool, however uncool it may be. True nerds are so unfazed by the line between cool and uncool that it inadvertently makes them cool. And for that reason, I was happy to take the time to be cool for a few weeks. I've come to find out that creativity is like a muscle. Something that must be worked so it may get stronger. The stronger one's creativity, the more limitless they are. As you can only grow as far as your mind can see. But if your mind is always growing, you're essentially limitless. So I guess all I'm really saying is this. I can't wait to earn the title of nerd.